Hello there. Um, a couple of things. What, oh, that sounds really serious. It's not going to be serious. In three, two, one, I'm going to be not serious. Um, I'm completely naked. So there's that. If you can hear dangling. Um, I'll explain why in a minute. And also, I, is that illegal? I guess it's audio. If it was video, it'd be, I'd be exposing myself. But it's audio, so it's perfectly allowed. And as long as I don't say anything sexy. Um, but yeah, Billy Bollocks. And uh, if there's some rustling, it's because I've got a plastic bag on my head. So if you can imagine that scene, what it is, is um, I'm dyeing my hair because I'm a man of, um, you know, a millennial man. I want to look cool. So I'm dyeing my hair and uh, so I don't get dye on my clothes. I've got, um, I'm, I'm naked and the um, something to do with the toner or something that I need a plastic bag on my head. Anyway, uh, now I've set the scene. Um... I really don't want to go into selling you anything. What have I been up to? Fucking nothing. Making more of these. And you can support this at patreon.com slash the downbeat. Just a fucking quid. That's that one done. Or if there's t-shirts, www.thedownbe.at. So it spells downbeat. I don't know why I've gone slightly northern, sort of a northern area of England there. Um, There might be t-shirts if there's not. Right, that's out of the fucking way. Um... If you were listening to it on the Patreon, you would have this early. It'd be like some sort of time travel. Isn't the Patreon great, everyone that's on the Patreon? <laughs> I actually made myself actually laugh there by fake laughing. My guest this week is I've got my guest this week is the salmon in between my teeth. My guest this week. Are these getting more insane? I think I'm drunk with power. Uh, 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 yeah, <laughs> cool. Professional podcaster. Uh, my guest this week is Nolly, Adam Nolly Get Good. You might know him as the, he used to be the bassist in Periphery, but he's mainly known for being a amazing producer and mix engineer. And he's an old friend of mine. I think we figured out it maybe been seven or eight years since we speak, spoke to each other properly. Um, so we just sort of caught up, talked about, he's worked with architects. He produced the, um, he produced Holy Hell, I think. Or engineered it, and he engineered the drums on the new one. Can't be bothered to figure out how to say that that name again, but they got number one, didn't they? That was good. Well done. Um, we talked about you know, working with Devin Townsend when Devin Townsend had three different drummers. Um, what makes a good drummer? What makes a good musician? The parallels between making coffee and making music. Um... We came to the conclusion that a drummer that we thought was fake is actually real. Um, yeah, just a lovely, just a lovely time. I had a lovely time with Adam Nolly Get Good on the Downbeat podcast. Wait a minute. Um, I've had to come back. It's me again. Um, because I just listened to this, and if you listen really carefully, right at the beginning of the podcast, you can hear the plastic bag rustling on my head. <laughs> it's the funniest shit ever. So go back and listen to that. ASMR. Anyway, here's Nolly. I'm going to count to four, and then we're both going to clap four times in that tempo. In that <laughs> okay. way, I will sync it up. It's not only is it a challenge, but I will sync up the. Uh, the uh what's it called wave waveforms <laughs> that's yes. it okay right okay ready yep one two three four how was that for you great clip so my microphone me, but that should be fine that's fine for me it, everyone else seems out of time because obviously oh. i'm starting it because yeah of, of course cause, so sometimes you get like a nice Sometimes you get like a nice, exactly displaced sixteenth note, right? <laughs> and that's when that's when I know it's in time. Oh dear! So I wasn't in time then. Uh, no, you were fine. We How... felt like like a good crowd clap, you know, like the kind of clap you'd want on a record, not where it's like everyone's exactly the same time. It just sounds like one clap, you know. It's yeah, multi-tracked yeah. claps. Yeah, I thought I thought it was fine. Speaking of that, I had a big thing the other day where I was watching an Animals as Leaders set. And they get the crowd to clap this crazy fucking ostinato, and the crowd gets it immediately. Really? It's like, 
One, two, three, four. Do you know the song I mean? I think it's Cafo is the song. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but the crowd, they get, like, I think Javier goes, does it once, and then the crowd immediately gets it. And I'm just watching it like, we can't get people to clap Outbreak, which is 4-4, four, four, <laughs> 180 BPM. And people are like, what? Yeah. Where, where, okay, two things. Fair play, but it is like one of their better known songs, I guess. And it's a really geeky crowd. Um, True. And then secondly, where were they? Because different places in the world are, you know, hugely different in terms of clapping ability. Don't know if you found that. <laughs> That's insane. No, I haven't. Uh, actually, no. Yeah, I think I have. I don't want to shame any countries. But no, but this was... Let me see your reaction with this. It was Brutal Assault Festival, Czech Republic. Wow, Okay. So that, now that, you're that's impressed. That's a curveball. Yeah, no, I am impressed by that. I was going to say, yeah, I think I South America are really hot on it. You know, like, there's what, so much. clapping? Yeah. Oh, I guess so. Like, every country, every region has, like, their own claves in, in a lot of those countries. I mean, whether it's Brazil or Chile or, or Argentina or whatever, they've all got, like, these national rhythms pretty much, you know, and they've all got that built into them, so. Have you experienced a, a clave clap? Yeah, First I think hand. so. Yeah. I don't know if you know this, my wife is Chilean. I know that, but yeah. what, so you going around clapping with her or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that's what we do. That's, you know, she took me to a, to a clapping event on our first step. No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> no, but there's a lot, a lot of stuff. Like we've been to what they call like a fondo, which is like a, like a county fair, basically, kind of thing in Chile. And they have traditional music and get this, like the, the, the traditional Chilean dance, the cueca, is... It's in three, but everybody claps on the two and the three and not the one. And you add that into that, that there's like these kind of folk instruments that are done with strumming patterns, which are like in quintuplets and stuff like that over the top of this. And it's just normal to them. It's just normal to them. And it, the whole thing kind of sounds a bit Jay Diller. Like there's like a, there's like a shaker, <laughs> which has like, I guess, a, just another traditional folk instrument that's like a little bit off kilter, but everybody that, just gets so it. That's so sick. Yeah, and I, I did not get it at all in the beginning. I was like, this is weird. Where's the one? The white guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I'm the prog guy. I was disappointed in myself. I was like, I should be able to get this. And you just the fact they weren't even clapping though, the one. They're just going like... <laughs> <laughs> like That's fucking cool. Yeah, it's great. How have you been, man? I haven't spoke to you in ages. Yeah, I'm gonna, I was thinking that before we got on. I reckon it must be six years at least. No. I think so. Since we well, okay, since we hung out in person, like when no, that you had, is for sure six years because yeah. that was when I had that little drum room. Exactly. Yeah, wow. your mum and dad. That's so long ago. Yeah. Well, we both. Well, life six years happens, and you know a lot happens in six years. I should say. That's fucking crazy. What, what are you doing with yourself? Um. So. I've kind of got a few different things that I do in varying amounts depending on necessity. So there's still like the mixing kind of side of things, which, um, you know, I used to do more production and have gradually over the years gone more in the direction of just mixing. Um, I still do like to get in on at least one day of the drum tracking on the first day if it's a project which is being recorded close by so I can just make sure that everything's being recorded kind of well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, mixing is just that much easier because you're not on the clock, you're not in the studio for like weeks on end. Um, and you can fit it around your timetable that much better as well. So I've got my kind of audio mixing stuff, which I didn't even do that much of in 2020. I was doing a lot more for Get Good Drums or Get Good Digital, as it's now going to be called. Um, Ooh. Of, yeah. Yeah. We've recorded mm. a lot. I mean, in the downtime, I, I recorded multiple drum sample libraries um one and a half of which are me actually hitting the drums which is pretty hilarious because of because of covid ruling out assistance uh i do actually remember though i mean six years ago you were perfecting your rim shot in order to do this because i remember you sat on my drums doing it yeah so six years of rim shot practice i reckon that's going to be good i've got a good right-handed rim shot <laughs> Like, that's fine that's all yeah. you need to do in a sample library it is yeah but i think the issue is when you're doing like 
lots of drums or lots of cymbals. Like for me, I can I can do that for maybe twenty minutes and start to get a little bit of like a tennis elbowy feeling, and then I, I oh, did shit. I did I, like I didn't even think of that. Yeah, I just haven't got you know I, I don't know. I, I don't even think of drum like drums being because I've done it for that long. I don't even think of them as being physical at all. I That's just think crazy. of it like writing. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to sit down and write with a pen. What what kind of percentage of your energy are you putting in? I know that's a weird question. I mean, like, when you're drumming, not in a show, and you want it to sound good, like you're drumming full on, but you're not, like, trying to, to impress anyone with how hard you can possibly hit. How much, how much kind of energy are you exerting? Well, here's the thing about me, Nolly. I'm I'm top heavy as a human, right. and I reckon when I'm playing the drums as hard as I possibly can, I am. This is not a flex because I'm about to just spin it on its head. But if I'm playing the drums as hard as I physically can, like if I'm attempting to be Eloy, yeah, with my with the top half of my body, I, I reckon I'm probably using twenty percent of the energy. But any kind of double kick Mm. whatsoever will put me into 90 percent even if it's like 150 sixteenths i am completely fucked i don't know what it is right that's like you trying to match that intensity with your lower half as well yeah and I, i can't do it any other way i cannot kick lightly oh and just in general yeah i just can't do it no, it's a technique thing. I mean, I can do like a little, like a ba-bum, where the first one will be light. Mm-hmm. But the minute, particularly the minute like there's an- another instrument playing, yeah, I, in my head, all that I, I think it's like a a fallout from being in band practice when you're a kid and nothing's mic'd up mm-hmm. and y- you have to be louder than the guitars. So you're like, okay, I just need to be louder. So now anytime I play with any musician ever, I have to just be louder than them. <laughs> <laughs> with the bass drum specifically. Specifically with it. Well, because that's the one I could never hear. Yeah. So it's like, so when I, when I actually switch to uh, Porter and Davies for my microphone, for my kick drum monitoring, I started playing so much better because I was feeling like... I was feeling lighter hits and being like, okay, so that did definitely happen rather than it's stupidly gated in my ears and that feels like I didn't do that. So next time I do that, I should hit it harder. That's interesting. You know, I've never thought, it makes so much sense. I guess it's a lot like vocalists going to in-ears for the first time and kind of realising that they don't need to push and destroy their voice in, you know, a matter of seconds when they're on stage. Yeah, the the other the other mad one for that for me was um, having toms in my in ears because obviously mm-hmm. you can't push the toms that loud in a wedge. So when I switched to in ears, I was like, wait a minute, this tom is loud anyway, and I'm mm-hmm. not even striking it that hard. Yeah, big fan of that. M- most people don't. <sighs> I was just gonna say, like, you are probably more obsessed with drums than most drummers that I know. Yeah, that's probably right. But I think that's that makes sense. Because if I was a drummer, I would be... It's just like... It's it's like another kind of side of the brain almost. It's just like... It's like a listener's perspective that I'm enjoying drummers from. And I think a lot of the really great drummers I know, at least for the beginning parts of their career, just wanted to play and, you know just loved the actual act of playing and it would be really annoying if on day one of learning to play drums everyone sat you down and was like okay before you play drums you need to learn how to tune them exactly and maintain okay. that tuning and everything so the fundamental note in a babinga 16 inch floor tom <laughs> is a b or c that's another thing i've said it on the podcast a million times you are the best drum tuner i've ever met oh that's very kind of you to say thank you out of out of anyone and then probably the like number two is fucking Will Putney, and yeah. neither of you classically play the fucking drums. Yeah. So that's uh, something that just never. Your style of drum tuning with uh, do you, are you still doing it with the notes? Yeah. Your pitch pipe is honestly it's never failed me. Never it's on any session. 
any drum kit, any player, even... I mean, maybe jazz, which I've only recorded a handful of times in my production career, but... And perhaps jazz, you just stylistically, especially if it's a kind of boppy thing, it is like toms are cranked in a way, which I would never yeah. do any other time. But apart from that, like soft hitter, light hitter, clear heads, coated hit heads. Um, yeah, just that that tuning system, it never fails, you know, it never fails. I remember when I went and recorded that VK Bell bronze kit the cast bronze kit and it had been with you prior and we got it out and we set it all up and then I just went gling gloom 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 and it was like oh Nolly's been here (laughs) that's a funny kit man that you it was actually difficult I remember I couldn't tune the 16 to the note that I normally would it was higher because the pressure of the head like of the sorry of the rim the rims are so heavy that there was like a minimum amount of tension the head was going to have just from putting the rim on it without even tightening any tension rods but and the other thing was that it just never sounded out of tune i I don't know i think it's just like it never got that weird wobble like you get with all drums i don't know if it's just that somehow those overtones just don't exist on a bell bronze kit you know like i feel like it might have something to do with how there's in Wood has far more inconsistencies in the actual, like, grain. Because I found that, have you ever recorded acrylic kits? You get a good acrylic kit, it's the same sort of thing. Mm. Like, there's always, always a note in there without, like, a without... I mean, there can still be a flub in there. But even if you tuned it, you know, twice as low as you normally would, there would still be a fundamental note that stays exactly the same. I guess that makes Probably sense. Because it's a big, big bit of fucking plastic. Well, I think the other thing is like just the way the bearing edges are made on those. Probably, yeah, and that's is another similarity to like a cast metal shell, I guess. Like the bearing edge is just perfect in a way perfect. that yeah, it's, it's not going to completely gonna... perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting actually. I I don't know if I've had very many experiences now. You say it with high end acrylic kits. Um, and there's probably quite a lot of difference between a high-end one and a cheap one, knowing that it's quite a different like construction process, isn't it's, it? It's exactly the same as car, like metal drums. The minute you put a seam in it, not as good. Right. So like the the seamless acrylics sound incredible, yeah. but it's like fucking. If you even just visualize like, so like a bell, for example, like a literal bell. If you cut that in half and then welded it back together, there's no way that that bell is going to sound as resonant. Yeah. So that's that's my thinking. Anytime a drum has a seam, yeah, like the more seams, the less fucking resonance. Dan used to have this SJC wood acrylic wood on one drum, yeah. like with a acrylic middle. Yeah. Worst fucking sounding drums I've ever heard. Really? Because it's like, what makes a good drum? Well, not having as many seams. Okay, let's add four <laughs> extra seams. <laughs> as well as the pli- <laughs> seams between the plies and then the seams on the acrylic. It was it looked amazing. It sounded fucking horrible. The, the 16 and the 18, because I don't know if it was not like glued properly or whatever, but because it's like maybe four inches of drum before the acrylic... The 16 and the 18, if you hit the top of the drum, the the resonance is going, right, okay, so there's this big seam here, so we're losing some there, and then there's this much acrylic, another seam, we're losing some more there. So it never actually hit the bottom head. So the 16 and the 18 just sounded like gong, like mm. tiny little pancake drums. It was shit. Yeah, that's rubbish. Uh, you know, I think there's something so interesting that I haven't quite figured out still about, like, what shell resonance really does because there's a point where resonance is a bad thing you know like you can you, there are some thick wood shells like i know sona for example do like custom drums with quite thick shells and i forget i mean i'm not just talking about the old babinga ones anyway th- you know that there are thick shell drums which sound really great and project really loud as well and aren't really lacking in tone then you get really thin shells i mean like cheap kits tend to have very thin shells and that sometimes the shells are really resonant but in a way that's just not a nice resonance at all, you know, very kind of like pokey and mid-rangey and just weird sounding. So Yeah, it's 
there's a weird like I personally I know I have two of them, but the Babinga Tamas are my least favourite Tamas. The maple ones are the way to go, right? Or, the or... maples are fucking unbelievable. I agree. But I the, agree. The Babingas and everyone's like, oh, the, they tune so low. And I'm like, I actually don't think they do. I think they sound better higher. You recorded my Babinga, didn't you? With the Devon Townsend oh, yeah. and Noop used it. Yeah. Did you find, I find that I have to tune that thing higher than I want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I tuned it the way I normally did, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. You weren't bowled over with it. like there's kind of less tone on them, like less note to them. Yeah. Unless you tune them up more. And the kick doesn't squish in the same way. Like for that session, I used my maple one, my my gold maple 22 that's like every time I get a maple kick drum, it it just squishes on that attack in such a satisfying way. But it's the same when you're playing it. Playing a maple kick drum just feels like you get more out of what you put in if you know what i mean yeah with with babinga i feel like i don't know i feel like everyone's obsessed with it because it sounds funny and it looks cool and it's expensive but, let's not overlook and it's expensive, the fact that it's the yeah. expensive one <laughs> but honestly like even I've, some of the best toms i've ever heard you might disagree those fucking the mapex satin ones with the just the whatever it is maple with a little bit of walnut in it or some of those some of the little ones sound incredible yeah, I agree. Hate, ma- hate Mapex, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean they're not a cool brand to like, but I still have Matt's uh, Matt Halpin's Euro Touring Mapex kit that I guess he hasn't used in a while now. That we also recorded Periphery Three with. It's kind of just lived with me <laughs> this whole time, um, and I love that kit. And and he's got it in everything from eight to eighteen, um, with. Well, I mean, there's a couple of drums I don't use, like there's a, an 18 inch kick drum that he used for teaching and stuff. But that kit you could use for anything, I agree. And the toms sound great. And I think those bearing edges have got quite a lot to do with it. Um, but yeah, those, those are really great drums. I um, This is probably the most I've talked about actual drums on this podcast for maybe six months. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, is that a good it's- thing? Yeah, I think so. I think I was, do you know what? I was, I got a little bit of a, a little bit of bee, of a bee in my bonnet about people calling it a drum podcast because I was like, well, realistically, I've done the, you know, maybe half and half drummers and non drummers. Um, and then I kept getting like people, oh, you should get this guy on. And it was just always like, just whatever the flavor of the day metalcore drummer who's got massively quantized triggered videos on instagram like you should get this guy on and i just ended up saying to people like what the fuck am i going to talk about like do you slip edit or do you use the fucking pro tools beat detective to fix your fucking videos so it just got to the point where i actually started not doing drummers because no one really i don't know anyone like i contacted mario from gojira and he was like oh i don't really feel confident with my english and i think eloy was the same Right. So, and I contacted you ages ago to do this because I think a producer side of things in general, and because we're mates and I want to catch up. But then we sort of just put it off. And then you hit me up. Honestly, it was the day after I started thinking about it again. So I was like, gotta get Nolly. Gotta get Nolly on there. That's cool. That's a good, good little. Um... What made you do it? Because it came completely out of the blue. I don't know. I think I just had it in the back of my mind and probably, you know, yeah, just those things happen where there's like something which is left undone that you said you'd do. And it kind of, um, I don't know, sometimes you just kind of feel weird, like going straight back into another conversation with that person without acknowledging the fact that you haven't done something in the past. Um, and you know yeah. how it is. Like sometimes you end up not speaking to people for a while because you're like, oh, well, said I was going to do that thing and I haven't hit him back up about it and so I'm just going to like leave it for a while. You know? Oh, Which... I know exactly what you mean, but I'm actually probably the worst for that. I, I will go back to ask some someone something, see that they've asked me something and I've not replied, but then I'll still ask them. Fair enough. That's, that's and, probably but, uh, the best so... thing to do. No, but then it's like, oh, sorry, man, missed this. I didn't fucking miss it. <laughs> I just <laughs> didn't want to answer it. Um <laughs> But that's the thing, because I don't know if you still want to fucking do it. This isn't a pitch, but I remember, I think 
it was either you or Matt came to me and was like, do you want to do a GGD pack? And I was like, fuck yeah, I want to do it. But I didn't, I was, mate, I was living. That's another story for another time, but I didn't have anywhere to fucking do it. But now, yeah. I reckon I'll get Roland to lend me something. We could do, do some shit. Absolutely. I mean, we, we really love doing these MIDI packs that we've been doing. Um, it's, it's crazy, man, because I, I used lots of other, other software for a while, um, for years and years before we had GGD and I never saw that much point in the GG sorry in the <laughs> I never saw that much point in the MIDI packs and I don't know why but recently like the last couple of years it really started to make sense for songwriting um and it's just been really cool like there's there's been a really nice community built around GGD now and there's lots of people actually using it for songwriting and now that we have these like these one kit wonder products which are just like very simple drum sample libraries that already sound great they pair up really nicely with people's e-kits and stuff like that so the whole thing is just making so much sense at the moment i'm sure we'd love to to do one with you still i feel Um, feel like you you probably felt the same way i feel about those things like in a weird way i'm like i I can program drums why would anyone ever want to buy midi packs but i guess they do yeah it's it's just really well I, i guess the world's just changed so much hasn't it in terms of people putting out content constantly in ways that they weren't before and you know so many people now able to make music at home when they're just starting out in a way that wasn't possible before and it's just really cool i think for a lot of people it's like having a jam with a drummer now and i think in the past yeah. a lot of the midi packs would either be like actual songs like a Meshuggah song or like yeah they'd have some session drum and just running through songs they've actually played which is a little bit weird to like rewrite everything on top of an existing song basically you'd never really feel you'd own that song i think yeah um or there'd be like really basic just like a whole selection of various patterns like oh this is 30 second note kicks with a quarter note backbeat on the spock symbol or something like that so what so what's the ggd ones then how does it work i think it's a lot it's kind of up to the people that do it but most of the time when we talk to the drummers ahead of them doing it what they do is they kind of imagine a song, uh, in, a, in a way, you know, like they kind of come up with just a cool beat and then they develop it. Like, well, if this was a, a verse, then, you know, I could do this for a pre-chorus and then kind of come up with variations for it. And it's a lot more about those, that drummer's creativity on a kind of fictional song, as it were. Um, that makes sense. Did you do re- Bard or did, did Tune Track do that? The guy from Leprous? Oh, yeah, no, that was us with also Seaman uh, Sandness as well. Uh, those two guys, they're both Norwegian drummers and they did a, a pack together. They're both great. The guy, but yeah, Bard's the guy fantastic, from Leprous is... I remember just coming across Leprous for the first time like maybe two years ago and I was like, this is incredible. And this drummer, just his ideas are just mad. Yeah. The shit he comes up with. And I'm like, I just... I know what you're doing. I wish I'd come up with it first. Yeah, he's really, really good, isn't he? I, I don't know how long has he actually been playing in Leprous. I remember when we toured with Shining, going back like six, seven years ago now, the drummer that they had at the time, I want to say his name was Tobias, was the drummer in Leprous at that time. I think maybe he's done two albums. I think maybe he started mm. with, um, is it The Congregation? Is that one yeah. of them? I don't, I, <laughs> Listen I to us. We've got no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> Chatting. I made an in, I've made an entire career of not knowing what I'm talking about. But that's the thing. I, I think my dad sent me a link to like a, I feel like a Larry King. Because you know, Larry King died. And my dad sent me a link. And it's Larry King just basically said, oh, I just, I like to know as little as possible about everything I'm talking about. Because then you ask the questions that like the layman is wanting to hear. Yeah, that so, does make I mean, sense. That, doesn't apply to the two of us saying getting lepra songs wrong, but <laughs> applies to my. That's something that when I heard it, I was like, "Oh, I could use that to describe my laziness in a nicer way." But like, actually, I'm doing this for you guys. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I actually mean, not researching my guest for you guys. Yeah, but I guess I guess it makes sense. I mean, the the idea of having to to research and come up with, um, yeah, really pointed questions that are very specific is just. It's just another way of doing it. And maybe that's what we're used to seeing from the kind of television styles and interview styles that we hear. But I think this is cool. This is a cool format for doing it. It feels very low pressure as well to participate in. 
Thank you, mate. Uh, that's another. That's another thing I'm trying to do is th- the low pressure. There's no pressure. There's no pressure at all. We're having a lovely coffee. I've got nothing. I've got no questions. I've got stuff in my head that I want to talk to you about, but I ain't got questions written down. I've done a few where I did, where I like don't know the person. And I'm like, okay, I'll do this, and then it just ends up feeling like festival fucking press, and mm. I can hear that they don't care. So I'd never want to be that guy. Yeah, there's a bunch of those guys. I'd rather not be that that guy. No, this is cool. I'm sure that's why people listen to to the downbeat. That's awesome. What I do want to ask you seamlessly into mm-hmm. a thing before I forget. <laughs> I've actually got because I've got a Patreon now. So what I'm going to try and do is um, there's some questions from the Patreon. We'll do those at the end. Okay. Nice. They're very. Everyone's very happy for Nolly to be on the show. Sweet. Um, but what I want to ask you is did, like. Number one, on the Devin album that you did, did you mix it? So I've, I've worked on two. I mixed, I, I, I uh, recorded the drums for Transcendence in Canada with so, Devin. Yeah. That was with Ryan on drums, and I mixed that record. And then on Empath, um, I recorded the drums again, and we kind of all went to Mono Valley and had various stations. Like there was um, Nathan Navarro on bass he was tracking, and... Um, Devin was tracking stuff. It, it was a really cool experience, kind of like a holiday camp. And um, Devin wasn't sure what he wanted to do mixing wise with that. And then during the session, he leant, he leant, gosh, he leaned towards me mixing it. And he came back to England again a few weeks later, and we mixed the record. And he was really, really happy with it. And then he got home and sent me a text. I guess from his car while driving from the airport back to his house, he's like, I'm just listening to the mixes that we did, which we worked like 18 hour days on, by the way. <laughs> like it was, it was a very intense mix session. Um, and he was like, oh, you know, there was just something about the demos that was more weird. And I like that weirdness about it. And so like he, he started by asking if I could send him like stems, which I did. And then he was like gradually just kind of like supplementing the stems I'd sent him with, like his own fader moves he was doing on the raw tracks on his end. And over the course of, I guess, a month or so, I think basically he ended up just using my drum stems um, and mixing everything again on top. So the, what you That's... hear, the empath that got released is <clears throat> Devin's mix. And actually, I think uh, whenever I'm in the studio, I, I do a mix down of the edited drums after you know the tracking that day usually yeah. so that everyone can get excited about hearing what's been recorded that day sounding all pro and i think he actually used some of those which were mp3s as the drum stems like he preferred those to my actual mixes that i did later or something holy so, shit so that's I mean, pretty that, interesting that i don't know devin but that sounds like the kind of thing that he would do based on his public persona. I'm just like, ah, I'm just going to fucking do this because I like it. Yeah. But what I was going to ask you about that is, was mixing three different drummers all with the most insanely different playing styles impossible? But I guess... You know, it it was not as big a deal as you might think because the stuff that was more similar, like there was a lot of, of um, Samus, of Sam, being comped in with a noob. And it would be just like, it is like really micro comps of a noop doing a beat. And then there'd be like a split second of blast beat, which would be Samus. And then it would be back to a noop again. Um, That's and, crazy. I mean, those were recorded back to back in the same live room. We literally like pulled down a noop's kit. Samus arrived from the airport on the day that, um, that a noop finished. And we set up. Um, Sam's rental kit with all of his symbols and just literally moved all the microphones back into place. A couple of extras because he had a, a bigger kind of array of, of symbols. So, like, nothing really changed um, in terms of the recording method. It was different drums and a different drummer, but it wasn't too bad. And then the Morgan Agron stuff, we did much the same, but Morgan's setup is just so weird and different. And is it? What's he playing? He played the Gretsch kit, which was, it like, belonged to the studio which was an older 70s kit with like a... a the 24? No, I want to say it was a 22, um, which he has directly in front of him. But then he also rented or had provided to him a 24, which had like a coated ambassador on each side with no muffling. 
and Ooh, it's hell. way out to the right in front, like diagonally to the right, and he's using just the slave pedal of a double kick to access it. Um, and it's mental because because he records himself at home and he has these really weird techniques, which include a stereo pair of microphones on that kick drum in front of it. So where you'd normally have a kick out, he has two hard panned, and it just sounded absolutely mental in the room like just completely wide open 24 it sounded like yeah just crazy boomy orchestral kind of thing and he's is got, it in the mix yeah yeah i mean yeah it is especially if you listen on some on a song like um sprite um there's that's that's a, a fully morgan song in terms of the drumming and you'd almost think there was a layered sample coming in or like another sound effect, like a boom. But Morgan's just such an su- like such a unique player and he doesn't play like other people play. He's got that slave pedal for the 24 right next to the the single pedal that he's got on the, his main, like on the, on the 22. And he will sometimes kick on both simultaneously and stuff. So the 22 is really dry, like just full of pillows. And then sometimes he'll kick on both to get a boom and... And That's like the attack, sick. and then sometimes he'll only do the the boomy kick, and he plays with two ride cymbals on his right, and like a tiny china, and some big hats. It was like a just not at all what most drummers in our scene play, and obviously he's not from our scene. You know, he's a a zapper drummer. Um, he just did that one video with Frederick that we all know, and so we all think that he that he gents. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the crazy Man, thing is that he video, does. though, <laughs> yeah. that video changed my fucking life. Yeah. Honestly did, because I'd heard Meshuggah and everything, and obviously I loved Meshuggah then, but just the jazzy drums, if anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, it's Morgan Agron and Frederick, what is it, what's his second? Thorn- Thorndahl. Yeah. Thorndahl from Meshuggah, and it's it's Fred's solo stuff, and it is essentially fucking jazz drumming under Meshuggah. Yeah. And... It so as I understand away. it, it was a show called Trum in Sweden, which is like a drumming show. And I, th- I don't know, but Morgan normally plays with um, this keyboard player, Mats, and they kind of do like a, a boppy, kind of quirky, jazzy thing. So I don't know if Morgan's a regular like guest on that show or was, what's happening. But whatever it is, like metal was not the usual thing that was played on there. So I think actually Frederick is the odd one out. In yeah. in that recording, but to everyone that knows Meshuggah, it's um yeah, it's crazy. And I remember Morgan talking about that when we were there. He was like, It's so crazy that he didn't think anything of it. And he's a really like in the best way, kind of childlike character where he's just like totally humble, totally just stoked about drums. Sound checking him was the easiest thing because you literally just put him in front of a kit and he will play indefinitely. I mean, ask him to hit anything twice in a row on purpose and he's just not going to do it like he'll hit the rack on once and then kind of get distracted by a something true else jazz spirit yeah but it's amazing um and yeah he spoke about how like he didn't think anything of that show and it like made his career <laughs> really in terms of like that's how i know um, who he is yeah it's fucking it, honestly it made me i think it was after that that i figured out the six stroke role because i think i asked my drum teacher i was like this thing he's doing here what is that? <laughs> and then he was, ah, oh, it's a six straight roll. And then he taught me, I was like, okay, I'm so overusing that. At what stage that. were you as a drummer at that point? Me- oh, crap. I think I, was, I think I was in, just in punk bands at that point, I think. I must have been 15. I was crap at the drums until I got into a music college and I was still crap at ACM. And then I was like, I'm going to fail unless I get relatively good. And I'll just bought an electric kit and i just sat on it for like four years straight really that's so crazy i yeah. actually never realized that you'd gone to to music college that's awesome yeah when did viatrophy was... happen in all this was that after music college that was after yeah i was already already had a degree in music and then i joined a death metal band because <laughs> i think the first time i became aware of you was under the context of like reynolds is a sick metal drummer and you were blasting, you were doing your Incorrect. stupidly Incorrect. fast single kick blasts and stuff like that. That was back in the day. You can't do that now. And I can still blast. That's one thing. I could still blast without practicing blasts. I could still knock out a 230 blast. 
No problem, even if I'm not doing it. Kicks. Single footed? Uh, probably not 2.30. I think there's a video where, uh, There's a video on the internet of Viatrophy playing in India and we're, we're playing Draining What Remains, which is 2.40 and I'm jet lagged and I'm one footing it and you, like the guy goes and takes a video of my foot and then it goes and I had to switch to two. It was almost like the pressure. Yeah. The pressure of him doing that. But feet, my feet are just fucking, I don't know what's happened. I, they've never been good, but lately they're just just awful. It's, it's speed, I get, I just, you've recorded Rudy a million times. Like the amount that that man has to practice and warm up to stay at his speed. Like at some point in my life, it sucks to say it, but I did like like risk assessment with my time investment. And it was like, so I need to practice and warm up for two hours every single day if I want to be able to maintain a consistent 180 BPM to 220 BPM double kick. Have I ever earned three hours worth of wage from that in my life? Probably not. Like, financially, this is a complete fucking waste of time. So I just stopped fucking doing it. And obviously, when you stop doing it, you get worse at it. But it just, it, it clicked. It's the same when I started recording bands. Or like, you know, you know, I know a little bit about recording because I, I had that grand intentions of, I'll oh, just record drummers or whatever, learn how to record drums. And then it was, I was teaching drums in the same little room at my parents' house that you know. Um, and it would be... You know, I'd be teaching drums was like thirty pound an hour. If I did three in a day, that's ninety quid. And then, or I'd be recording a band who the drummer hasn't practiced, and they'd be in there all day for seventy five pounds. And then when they've gone, I either have to edit everything or play it again myself anyway. And I did the like per hour on that, and it was like seventeen, eighteen hour days for 75 quid I was like I'm making three pound an hour and I've cancelled a week of 90 pound a day drum lessons to do that right that's out as well I don't know where where it where it came from just my I mean that makes a lot of sense man I I, you're saying like it's a sad (laughs) thing but I think if you loved it if you loved death metal drums I mean Rudy loves that stuff and he thinks it's super, super cool to be able to do it. I don't mean that. Weirdly, that sounded like a knock when I said that. I didn't mean that. I mean, like, he loves how it sounds when he's able to drum like that. So he's willing to put that work in. And and I think for a while, because he used to be faster before, I think there was like a turning point when he filled in for monuments, um, where he suddenly became really powerful hitting and kind of like... I think he, I he actually it, yeah. lost some speed then. And I, I was going to bring that up. God, this is a very convoluted interjection on my part. But I was going to bring that up with you no, talking about your good. speed. You know, I think there's there's definitely this thing where if you are a drummer who likes to kick hard, there's definitely a ceiling to how fast you can go. Because the guys that have the ultra, ultra fast kicks, and I'm talking faster than, than Rudy does, um, are playing, you know, they're either training like absolute madmen guys guys like crim for example who's i know running like marathons every day or something like that guy's in incredible yeah. incredible shape um or they're just tapping and triggering which there's you know if you're achieving those speeds and you're getting really nice consistent sounding like machine gun kicks i don't i don't mind at all if you're triggering that's super impressive you know if your timing's gr- good at those speeds but I think there's a point where you just you can't get a bass drum to sound really great by being kicked hard and play at those speeds anymore. Like it just can't be done. You can't. And I literally today I had um I've got a thing where I'm doing Twitch now, right? And it accidentally became two reaction videos, which I didn't want it to do. But I just watched <laughs> two videos on uh, YouTube and then I just reacted in a normal manner and I was like okay I'll put these on YouTube because it'll be it'll be funny and I'll just put some mad clickbait on it but the amount of people because I said in one of the things it was a Eloy Casagrande video and it was him doing a Slipknot have you seen the, him doing the, Heritage the recent Anthem? one oh yeah. yeah so popped it on and uh, 
there's a bit where he's doing insane double kick. Obviously, it's Heretic Anthem. And I, like, stopped it, and I was like, look, that is probably one of the best, if not the best, metal drummer in the world right now playing kick drums, real kick drums. You can hear the inconsistencies in the notes because that is a real drummer playing real drums very, very well. And uh, and if you think that... And I, I, I can't remember who I called out. I think it was that Slaughter to Prevail band. And I was like, I think I, if you are watching a video, right, and it sounds like a perfect sample every single note and it's faster than that, you are being deceived. I'm not saying that the person isn't playing it, but there is some trickery making it come, you know, come to your ears. Before it hits your ears, there is some trickery somewhere, whether it's triggering or quantizing or whatever. And the amount of people that are very triggered by <laughs> by what I said, and they're coming at me with like, you, uh, you, you're a pathetic loser that thinks that people's hard work mean and the fact that you can't do it means that they're cheating and then reeling off like lists of drummers this one guy listed five drummers out of the five drummers three of them well known for a hundred percent triggered kick drums and the other two i think two of them were actually like quite legit but out of those three, all three of them double strokes triggered as well. Yeah. It's like, you're not listening to what I said. Yeah. I'm not saying it's cheating or whatever, but it's like the people are being deceived. I've got a massive beam of bonnet about it. Like it's my equivalent of, you know, mo- unrealistic ex- expectations that young girls have of models because of how break thin they are, like genetically impossible. The YouTube quantized, you know, there's a guitarist that we both know that did it. Like, that is not healthy for people to fucking, to think that that's real. Yeah, there's a, there's a, that's a really good point of comparison, I think, to, to kind of body image stuff that happens. Um, I mean, I think the difference, though, is that I think a certain amount of naivety for musicians can sometimes lead to them achieving things that other people haven't tried to achieve in the past. Like, guys like Rudy, guys like Malian... I was just about um, to say, I think this is why Rudy is quite so fucking mental and quite so good at drums because he's maybe when he was a kid, when he was on the internet being really fucking good at drums, he had those unrealistic expectations and then he it caused him to push the envelope. Yeah. So I, I'm, I don't want to cut you up there, but I'm like, I'm with you. But I, half of me is like, this is evolving drumming. But the other half is me is like, how can these people be that stupid to think yeah. that that's real? Yeah, it's weird. And, and I mean, in guitar, it's happening too with the Instagram clip videos where people are like, they're posting stuff that sounds like Guitar Pro, you know. And as you say, there's people that have been doing this for longer, people doing it longer than the person that you and I are referring to. I mean, that Necrophagist album, you know, uh, what's it called? The, the Necrophagist Epitaph. album. Yeah, that's pretty much all done punched in note by note or like half speed or whatever and i mean fair play live they sound really good when they used to play live you know muhammad can clearly play um but like this insta thing of like all these guys doing just mental runs have you seen the dubstep one the new guy on the block tom morello shared oh my god oh fucking tom morello retweeted it and I was just like, fucking hell. This is That's that not... Buried Alive guy, is it? Oh, my God. I've not checked it out, was... but I've seen, I've seen people talking about it. I'm sure that the guy is good at guitar. I am sure that creatively he has come up with this new thing, which is very creative, and the noises are all creative. But people, especially someone like Tom Morello, retweeting it as if, like, what they're seeing is 100% real. It's like a fucking UFO video, like 100% undeniable proof that guitar, this is the best guitarist on earth. But I don't know what I'm annoyed at more, people being fooled by it or no one really, no one really admits like this is, this is not how I play. This is, this is what I make. 
And this is what all your favorite fucking artists make. And none of your favorite artists other than fucking jazz and maybe animals as leaders, like sound like they do on fucking record a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. I think it's just about honesty, isn't it? I think, I think the triggering thing is when you're aware that there isn't an honest conversation being had. And I think this applies to everything in life, really. I think if everyone's just honest about what's going on, it's totally fine. Like, it's, But it's the idea that someone is holding back information in order to, to dupe the people that are witnessing or listening to them and they're getting credit for it that's just very triggering to people that yeah. are involved in the field and, and realise that when it's done for those reasons, that is essentially a cheap trick. Have you seen... So this is one that I'm I'm really not sure. It'd be interesting to get your uh, view on. Have you seen the Chris Turner guy? I was actually just... He was in my mind when you were saying that. And I think right. it's taken... I mean, I guess I, I accepted it a few years ago, but I believe that it is real. And I've heard from I... drummer friends that have toured with him and producer friends who've had, you know, private conversations with me where they swear that it's real. But my instant reaction was like, what is this? Yeah, because it's just... <laughs> I was the same. <laughs> I was the same. That new one. Right. And then I went, I went back through it. Because I've seen I've seen him play live and he is fucking amazing. Yeah. But the the like it was the fact that he came out and said there's no sample replacement. That was the one that just made me go, what the fuck is happening here? Mm. And then, but I went back through it this morning, right? Because I'm getting because I'm posting all this stuff about drummers that I think are fake, and everyone is like, yeah, he's so adamant that it's real. Which one puts me off a little bit because I'm like, the lady doth protest a little bit too much. <laughs> but I went back through it at half speed today on YouTube. And I think it might be real. I think it is real, you know. I think it is. It's crazy. I mean, it it also doesn't help that the visual is kind of... Polished. Yeah, but I, I, what I meant more is like his playing style, like how he looks when he's playing <laughs> he looks like drums. He's falling in, falling off. Especially in the beginning, I remember the first time being like, "Where has this guy come from?" <laughs> like, <laughs> everything is set up weirdly on his kit, and he's striking really strangely, and looks very like I don't know, if stiff is the right word, but I mean, I don't think he actually looks he so much like that anymore, but. He looks like, no, he does. He looks yeah. like somebody, but I mean, I guess you have to to play like that. He looks right. like somebody just got a fucking, one of those Japanese, like, fuck dolls. <laughs> and they went, okay, let's put some MIDI in this thing. <laughs> and he just <laughs> fucking sat him down and was like, okay, stick that in there. <laughs> but I, I am honestly, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to admit this. I think I'm going to do it on stream later on today. I'm going to have to be like, guys. Because I originally I swear I went fuck off. There's no way that's real. And I've gone through it with the fine toothed comb, and I think it might be real. Yeah. The, what do, what's your views on the in terms of like a sample replacement? You think there's no samples there? I'm willing to believe uh, it. You know, I, I went from being like, this is wrong. This guy looks like he's not like. He's not a stereotypical amazing drummer in how his kit's set up and how he's sitting, how he's playing. And I've gone from that to, like, I think this guy actually has got one over everyone else. Like, he's figured out a way of doing it, and it doesn't look pretty, but he's gone for it and he's developed it to this obscene point. So having taken the, you know, the fact that I think he is really doing it, I think I accept it at the same time that there aren't samples. I mean, if there's no samples, he's somebody, him or other people, have been incredibly clever in the samples that they have chosen and the amount of variation they've put into them. Mm. You know what I That's mean? That's the like, thing I noticed when I, when I watched it at half speed. I was like... Because the, uh, the easiest thing to do is to put a YouTube video on at half speed and on a blast beat, you can very easily hear that every single snare drum sounds like a Phil Collins snare drum. And you're like, <laughs> okay, so that that's sample replaced. But this one, fuck, yeah. It was literally only this morning. I was like, oh, God, this is, I think this is real. But that that is like, 
I almost don't want to admit that I think it's real because then everyone's going to come out with these fucking double stroke drummers and being like, well, it's, you've said that it can be done, so why isn't this guy that's fucking tapping? Like, you can see that that Chris guy is not tapping. No. He's fucking stood up, pretty much. Yeah. I'm with you, man. If you go out there, I mean, put it this way, we're, we're both, we've both been duped if it happens. And I'd like to think that between us, we'd probably catch it if, if it was being done in any kind of traditional way that most people are faking stuff. Yeah, it's like... I mean, I said it when... The first time I saw it, I think I, I watched it on a stream, and I said, either this is fake or he's the greatest drummer that's ever lived. <laughs> and I feel like I'm going to have to fucking <laughs> concede that right. I think this might be the greatest drummer that's ever lived. And I don't think... I don't, it's not my style. That's not my favourite style. But in terms of, like, accuracy, if that doesn't have samples, imagine how easy he would be to track. Yeah. yeah, come in for fucking two hours and we'll do this whole album. Yeah. No, fair play, man. I, I think it's real. I think it's real. I'll go there. Because okay. I've seen, I remember, I remember being not skeptical, but well, eh, skeptical. <laughs> I remember being skeptical of Rudy, yeah. and when when I didn't know him, and you were recording him, and you sent me the stems to his Obscura song, and it yeah. wasn't on the grid, and I was like, oh my god, no, oh, yeah, it's this it's super this man impressive. is crazy. Yeah, it was it was one. I mean, for those, I was I was staying at his house for like a week, and we recorded a bunch of stuff, and. To be in his basement, which is just a small room where he plays drums, to be like sitting there in front of the kit and feel feel him blasting, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Feel the, the the sound pressure in there is really really impressive. He's he's unbelievable at what his he does. Poor mum. Yeah, his, his poor mum upstairs. Mom. Yeah. Fair yeah. play to her. Yeah, I think. Yeah, he's he's just had a good situation, I guess, and the right mindset, the right kind of obsessiveness and you know he's put a lot of work into the physicality of it as well which i know you have and so many drummers in this style kind no, of have no to, way right? i've put no way near as much into him as a, into it as him i'm just so glad he's in like Whitechapel now because that's a good for the longest for him, time it? yeah it's perfect for the longest time i was just like seeing my friend put all this fucking work in and you know still fucking and it's not a, a shameful thing and it was you know it's the starving artist but just still at his mum's and i was just like this man is one of the greatest fucking drummers in the world why doesn't he have the fucking the gig that is using him and i'm just glad he's i'm glad he's in Whitechapel. yeah i mean the poor guy had a lot of full starts you know he uh, joined yeah. a couple of bands that really should have taken him places, at least within, you know, the kind of music that he wanted to play, and both collapsed pretty badly, one of which you know plenty about. Mm, the big the big collapser. Yeah. I feel like he should be fucking why isn't Rudy in Slipknot though? Let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, you know, I again I agree with you. I think Rudy's amazing, but I think Slipknot requires a certain amount of messiness that Rudy doesn't have. <laughs> Impossible to be messy. Yeah, just yeah. get him drunk. Just Rudy drunk. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, Jay, like, Jay is perfect for Slipknot now. It's like, you couldn't... He's probably the closest, like, Joey. Joe, well, you, you, know, you were just Joe, talking Joey about the style. Eli video you just saw. Come on, yeah. if he wasn't in Sepultura. Oh, I, I would have Eloy in every band on the planet. <laughs> I think I said that in the reaction video as well. It's just like, it just just put him in every single fucking band. Who's your favourite... Like, let's go. Who's your favourite... Who's your favourite drummers? Wow, you're really putting me on the spot. Um, gosh, I don't know. I love. Okay, this this this. We'll cut it. Who who's your favorite drummer's style? And then I'm going to ask. You don't need to give me like a number. Just give me a few in terms of style or like uniqueness. And then in terms of tracking. Yeah, I think a drummer you like some fucking beasts. I have. I've been very lucky. Yeah, I would. I would love to track. Garska again, I think unbelievably Matt. That's a believe. What am I saying? I think Matt is definitely right up there. And oh, I, I fully agree. And I'm talking on like an all-time list, really. 
because yeah. he's totally got like the Vinicola Uta thing down. He's totally got so like he can he can do so much of what so many classic drummers could do. Um, I got to spend some time with Benny Greb um, about fifteen months ago or so before lockdown. Did you? What did you I do? Did, yeah. Oh, I can't say. I can't say because oh, he hasn't said. Fuck yeah. But, oh, um, I'm going to fucking... I was supposed to have him on the podcast and then I didn't end up going to the festival that we were supposed to do it and I'm going to um, email your doppelganger, Norbert, <laughs> <laughs> um, and message him and say, just hook me up with Benny because we're all at fucking home. I'm sure he's got a fucking microphone. Yeah. Um, so maybe he can tell me about that. But that's cool. Was he... I mean, he's my favourite drummer of all time. Yeah. Yeah, I know he's... He's amazing, yeah. He's so... Again, a bit like Morgan Agron, like to hear someone um, like sound checking, basically, so musically and creatively. And, and of course, it's such a different world to anything that I normally record drummer wise. And the way he utilized the kit, like for me, his drum kit was quite analogous to like a guitarist with a crazy pedal board that they can to get all these crazy sounds out of, you know, by combining things. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of things in there that draw from a history of other drummers, but the way that he treats all of his symbols like they are a crash, a ride, an accent symbol, you know what yeah. I mean? And and the way he utilises that cranked rack tom with the super floppy floor tom. I'm and, getting a fucking chub on just yeah. thinking about Benny. Benny Greb playing the <laughs> fucking drums right now. Um. But yeah, it's mental. Like if he, if he, again, maybe he's talked about this in videos, but he showed me like flipping off the wires on both the side snare and the main snare and then using it like, I think it's main snare, rack tom, low snare, floor tom kind of sounds like a, like a 10, 12, 14, 16 oh, kit or something like that, you know? So I just think it's super cool and so specialized and his feel when he does the the kind of cascara stuff or the the really kind of pushing the drunk drumming thing it's amazing yeah um, he's fucking I, I feel like matt matt is the benny of metal in terms of uh what he's bringing what he's bringing in from the different the diff, like the amalgamation of different like, like you said like vinny and stuff mm -hmm. and then being able to stick it in metal yeah, like some of the stuff Matt comes up with. How, how did you ever come up with that? Yeah, that guy. I mean, I remember going back a long time with recording Joy of Motion. At that time, he was living with a friend of Tosin and Javier's, and I remember there was like conversations about how it was problematic how Garska was playing like ten hours a day in the garage. You know, just like what, well, just non-stop just... drumming, just every day, hours upon hours on the kit. I guess you've just got to piss people off to get that good. Most people would go like, for example, I can hear my fucking neighbour hoovering for the third time today. Most people would have stopped hoovering after the first time and thought, I better not do that because it's probably fucking annoying. <laughs> but the same, the same with drums. I, I've yeah. actually heard that about Matt during, during uh, tours. Yeah. People say that he just fucking sets a get up and just shreds on it all day. Yeah. And I think I mean that's that how you get that good, right? That's, that's how you come up cool, with yeah. those things. I guess so. Right, okay. So what, Benny's up there? Yeah, Garska's up there. I think Federico Pavlovich, do you know him? I met him he did that clinic with Matt Halpern. Yeah. Amazing drummer. I am um, absolutely unbelievable drummer, but do you know what? I got like he went in too hard on the clinic. I just fucking no one understood anything. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It I was think like you've heard that. I think his level is just so much higher than human being thinking that he was like trying to explain what he thought was a very simple displacement idea with a solo, and it was like okay, so it's going to be this one, two, three, four, and then just ripped this fucking like dotted eighth note displaced full drum solo to a click um and it was just like at no point did he fucking let off the gas at all which i guess i kind of respected but it was supposed to be like a learning clinic there's, there seems like there's a very insular scene within italy where federico's from 
And there are amazing musicians there, like amazing standard of drummers and stuff that never leave the country musically, like, um, or, or maybe don't come to English speaking parts of the world so much. Um, but yeah, I know that, that Federico is like pretty much just on call for whenever there's a, a, a son or artist doing like a clinic run through Italy. Like there's, there's some videos with rubbish sound quality of him shredding with Chris Coleman and that's another drummer that we should talk about in two seconds. Um, but Federico is he's keeping up 100% with, with Chris. Um, but yeah, that's Chris funny. Coleman, that's, that's a pretty ridiculous drummer. Such a fucking nice guy. Like, I had like... I feel like him, I, had that, I went to that minor drum festival where it was like Chris Coleman, Benny Greb, and like other, other fucking mad people... And I think I'd met Benny before, like we'd had dinner at, at like a, I can't remember if it was before or after the UK drum show. So I knew Benny and I knew that he was just a flat out legend. But then Chris Coleman, again, just blew me away with just how just, you can be that good and then not arrogant. And it's weird. There's like a, like a level of transcendence when you're that fucking good and then you're just a fucking legend as well. It's just like, oh, that's how everyone should be. Yeah. yeah that's Maybe amazing. that's why I'm not that good because I'm fucking <laughs> an arrogant cunt. Well, I mean, the States has this gospel thing that we just don't have. And it's ridiculous. I mean, there's, there's probably any number of gospel drummers that if I knew their names or watched them would instantly be on the list I'm trying to tell you now. Um but it's crazy, isn't it, the the output from from the gospel scene in the states and how good the musicians are? And then they're all multi instrumentalists. Like Chris Coleman's a sick bassist, for example, and probably rips on keys as well. Um, it's like I, I, I guess it also comes into the like what I'm saying about him being such a nice guy. Like that whole gospel scene is. I mean, I imagine I've fucking never been in it in my life, but I imagine it's like just showing each other licks and there's no like, well, I ain't going to show you that one. It's like, oh, that was fucking sick. What did you play? Here it is. I'll teach you it. And it's like a, a whole, like almost f like how drumming probably started. Someone just playing on a fucking, like a rock or something. And then someone else going, oh, what are you doing on that rock? And hey, go, I'll show you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. just like a communal communal like learning of the instrument which yeah we don't have here at all yeah i mean say what you want about christianity or, or whatever but that exactly as you're saying like the community aspect of of the gospel stuff as far as i understand it and the aspects of like family and humility and if you actually watch them playing actual gospel music not just like the gospel shreds like they're just holding down beats with great feel and you know they've got the choir there and everyone's singing along and it seems like it's just such a good background for building that kind of, um, you know, those kinds of drummers that can go on and then play essentially a drum loop for 45 minutes straight without playing a single fill and then shred like you've never seen before. What, what's happening with gospel chops at the moment? I feel like I'm a bit out of the scene. Like, I mean, I, I was never in the scene, so I have no idea. But I, I remember like when we used to spend more time chatting about drummers and stuff like six, seven years ago a lot of like the cool stuff that was coming up was from the gospel scene. And even guys like Matt Halpin in periphery, like when periphery got big, it was like, wow, it's this guy who's using like gospel chops. He's playing ghost notes, which at the time seemed really unusual in metal, you know, and now of course every, every drum is doing it. But I wonder like as someone that is tapped into the drum scene, are, are gospel drummers being kind of seen as much as they were I think four, five, it, six it, years ago. I think it changed the game so much. That's why you get some people that are quite bitter about it. Um, it changed the game so much and changed modern drumming that I feel like almost every drummer is playing something gospel-y now. Yeah. In terms of like the big name drummers. And that is why you get some, some people are very annoyed with... And it's a, I guess it's a valid argument, like the appropriation of the gospel culture by fucking people like me. You just going, oh, I'll learn, I'll learn that lick. I'll have that there. That was very, you did it better. You invented that. I'll have a go at that. And it's fucking been done for centuries. Uh, 
of other music and stuff. So I get, you know, fuck. But that's how music evolves, I guess. So do you think they're not standing out anymore, like all these gospel players, in the same way because, like, people have kind of heard it? And I mean, they definitely now. are because they definitely are. But it, it, it's like a metal drummer now. If you don't play like a gospel metal drummer, no one likes you. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? They're, so, I mean, there's still like you know, like St- Sticks Taylor. He plays for Justin Bieber now. Like. So, the like some of the gospel guys, they you know they're still getting the big the big jobs, but I think the the trail that they blazed is now just in modern drumming. Yeah, that makes sense. What and I think- feel like to the sorry to no, the, the lesser a lesser point, almost like in the nineties when double double kick metal was around. That made its way in. You had like, um, f- like Vinny having a double kick pedal, playing on a fucking Megadeth album. Like that changed modern drumming. So like, and almost then Chris Coleman's got a double kick. You know, like just for little, little bits here and there. I don't know where I'm going with that, but do you know what I mean. I think every now and again something comes along and it just is so cool that it becomes the common stock. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of diffuses out, right? What what do you think is like the new version of that? Or it has not has nothing come up yet? That's what I was just just trying to think. Do you think it's like the, the J Diller kind of like weird drumming thing? I mean I would love it to be that because it you you can't program that. It cannot be programmed. I would love I mean, that's the thing. I haven't really heard that in metal. The only, the no. closest, the closest thing I can think of in, in like theory is there's a Beneath the Massacre song with a really late snare drum in it, and it's like, and it, like the snare is really, really fucking. Like, do you know the song I mean? I do. It's called Nevermore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And live the they do it even more extremely, don't they? Yeah. That's the only thing I can think of. Like deliberately out of time metal drums i'm gonna fucking do it there's um well there's that band haken do you listen to haken i just i the first time i heard them was that rudy cover the other day oh cool they're, they're an and amazing I was band blown away. really really sick and of course think about the fact that rudy's playing these parts which were written by ray the drummer in in haken who's a beast he's a really amazing drummer in fact everyone in that band is incredibly talented but their new record because i've mixed both of the last two records they've done um, one of the songs called Carousel has a break in it where admittedly it stops being metal it kind of goes into like a fusion R&B aesthetic but he's That's doing cool. he's doing that yeah because I mean it is prog in the sense of before Gent was prog in everyone's yeah. mind you know so they really do kind of go off into other genres and have like little moments a bit like you know even more recently, bands like Between the Buried and Me and stuff like that would throw in little, you know, strange honky tonk moments and stuff like that. So he's he's like actually even, an amazing drummer that people need to know a lot more about. Does it get quantized though? Um, the quirkiness. Well, not in not in that part. I think on, on not the most recent Haken record, but the one before it, um, Vector. Sorry. One before it's Vector, yeah. The one that Rudy covered a song off of. That's relatively unquantized. I'm not saying there's no editing, but you can hear, and I remember hearing when mixing it, you know, that there's plenty of kick to snare flams left in if there's double kicks and like stuff not totally on the grid. I feel like the new album is more gridded, but honestly, I think it's more the the other instruments that are gridded, and I think the drums are still not just totally on the grid. And certainly for those breaks, they're not at all. I tell you who I've just thought of who is sort of doing the weirdness um and not many others are the contortionist. Oh really? I can't remember his name, the drummer for them. There's on their last album and all their albums, there's like there's just like symbol placements, which is just like okay. <laughs> I I I don't know where I would go on the grid or what to put that in. And that's fucking cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, he's is not Bobby, like... is it? It's the other one. It's uh, Rob, Robbie. No. I have no one. Joey, idea. Joey have... and Rob and... Joey, it's Joey. Joey, yeah. I think so, anyway. But, like, I feel like people are too scared to do stuff like that because... Because people now think Bran Daler from Mastodon is not good because they're used to hearing fully triggered, fully fucking sampled. Mm. Do you know what I mean? The the perception because of all these fake videos is that some of these drummers that are fucking unbelievable and incredible, but just choose not to polish their shit. Mm. The perception is that they're not good. So I feel like people I guess leaving... comes from like a slightly different stock within metal as well, though, doesn't he? He's like a bit more of like an old school approach. And to be fair, True, the yeah, number he's of never fills mixed... he throws in is definitely at times questionable. Oh, in the early stuff, like for, I remember the first time I ever heard Leviathan, I was like, okay, there's a fill every bar. Yeah. And at first I was like, I don't like this. And then I was like, I love it. <laughs> okay. I love this now. Um, but look, you know, that's the thing though. If you, if you triggered him, it would sound fucking horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it would just be someone sliding up and down a keyboard with like drums on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, just coming back to the drummers that are doing it, I reckon Bard from Leprous is doing it to an extent. Oh, fucking absolutely. Some of the weird kick hi-hat placements that he does. Yeah. Do you think maybe quintuplets is the new thing, actually? I feel like it's the new new old thing. I feel that like that's like been going for about ago. five years. Oh, fair enough. Damn. But no, but you're right. Yeah, but that's, I feel like that's people... That's almost the fucking the glitchy thing. The minute you put anything in quintuplets, it, it, it quintuplets, it goes glitchy. Hmm. Do you remember the first but time it, hearing like "Death of a Dead Day" by Sixth? I'm just like, thinking it was out of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, like <laughs> the I first time I heard, I was. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know the, out, the the ending section of Bland Street Bloom, that first song. <laughs> yeah, I remember like spending weeks listening to it, being like, "Wait, is that trip?" No, I. I don't think that's trick. Yeah, that but... <laughs> it was exactly the same. Yeah, I just didn't know what it was. And then, of course, I just it thought like, it does the weird tempo it. change. Oh, you thought it just thought wasn't it was right? just... Yeah, I thought it was just somewhere between. I was like, this sounds cool. But, uh, you know, he's... I don't think... And, ha... you know, who knows, maybe had the internet been more of a thing there, I'd have left a fucking YouTube comment. I would have been those guys. <laughs> kick drums, not really, not really nailing it on the kick drums. Actually is. It's just fucking far elevated to your level. I tell you what, I have the raw tracks for Bland Street Bloom on my computer. The real life raw ones? Yeah. Oh, the, the yeah, well, when the I, heady heights. Before I being a producer. Yeah. Before I worked with Six Sixth on their last record, I did a mixed test and they just sent me Bland Street Bloom to remix. Which was really Go surreal. On. Because if anybody Well, yeah, if anybody knows me, they know that Sixth is was pretty much well it definitely was a life-changing moment getting into sick and i spent a lot of time learning their stuff on guitar and tabbing it and stuff um so that that and that record was the one for me so it was it was really crazy to work with sick in the first place and then to like actually have the tracks and work on it i mean it sounds a bit dated now and there's all sorts of stuff you know now that i know weller you must know weller pretty well you've worked yeah. with him and stuff and, and you know, hearing him talk about what a nightmare it was doing that record and everything, you know, it's not the same when you're behind the curtain, but uh, the drumming is definitely nothing you can turn your nose up. It's amazing. I always feel like he's another one where I was just like, I'm just like, you're so good. Why are you not massive? I think, you know, I don't, I don't know Ford, actually. I've not met him, but from everything I've heard, he just really doesn't care about the exposure or anything like he's just loves drums is he was he doing like is he teaching or i don't know i mean that's what i mean like i hear nothing and but but there was a time where he was on all the fucking drum festivals and i was just like this guy's just gonna be one of the next fucking real big ones not you know it's fine if he doesn't want to be like that i just i hope he's satisfied in life because he really could have done anything with his drums. I hope he's doing what he wants to do. That's what I get by that. That's yeah. that's what I meant about Rudy as well. 
Yeah. And I was just know the amount of practice he's putting in. And in my head, I'm like, to not be in threat signal, <laughs> like, <laughs> fucking hell, I'd yeah. have given up. But Whitechapel really is the gig for him. I was thinking about it. I was listening to Whitechapel the other day and I was like, this amalgamates both sides of Rudy's drumming of like... Oh, it's perfect. Like the powerful slow groove thing and the the fast kind of whiddly whiddlies as well. And the quite again, traditional I'm, approach to fills and stuff. I've, I just really hope then... I mean, they're nice guys, but I've really hope they're not taking advantage of how much he loves being in a metal band. Because it would be in all fucking music, it is really easy to take advantage of the people who love music. Yeah, it's so easy to underpay them. It's so easy to get them to fucking do things that is almost a violation of human rights. <laughs> like all in the name of loving music, I feel like Rudy might be like susceptible to being like, yeah, I'll do that because I fucking love two hundred and thirty BPM single stroke <laughs> double kicks. I think Rudy got to a point, and I hope he doesn't mind me talking about him. Uh, I think he got to a point where he realised that that was screwing him over. I'm not even saying he did that particularly much, but I think he got to a point where he was a bit jaded, really, with music. Um, As you would be, coming from the fucking, the failure machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I, I hadn't spoken to him for a couple of years much, and then... He and I have been chatting a bit more during lockdown. And I get the sense that he's doing well and that he really enjoys being in Whitechapel and that he really gets on with the guys. So so I I'm fairly sure that combine that with his desire to to, you know, have the right things in place to be treated right in a band situation. And also knowing a couple of the options that he turned down from other bands that on the surface sounded really good and he sniffed out some things that didn't seem right about it. I think his his continued involvement in Whitechapel probably speaks to him being treated well and, and really enjoying it. What a fucking cl- what a clever answer. You're such a clever guy. Oh. Um, I want to talk about one more thing that I just like yeah. to do with you. Um, and then we're going to do some Patreon questions. Cool. Um if that's all right with you. But what I am also going to do is really quickly look for my wired headphones because my AirPods are shitting a brick. But please... Um, Tell you what, before you go any further, I just want to mention one name, which is Brody Simpson, before we move on from drums. Love him. I met I think, him in Perth. Australian guy. Yeah. Carry on. Keep well, going. I was going to say, you know, of all the Instagram drummers that I follow, I'm not calling him an Instagram drummer, so of all the drummers I follow on Instagram, his videos are the ones that like bring a smile to my face more than anyone else. It's they just sound so incredible. Great. Yeah. Like the mix, the weird fucking drums, whatever drums that he's doing. Yeah. Um, anyway, I just didn't want I, us to, I, to go on without mentioning his name. I can tell you a Brody Simpson story. Yeah. I landed in Perth, Australia, on a Straight From The Path tour. Stupidly jet lagged. Um, it was after we just done... I think we did, you'll know the slog of Europe, straight to America, oh. straight to Southeast Asia, straight to Australia. I've never so, done, I've never done such a horrendous combination oh. of tours in one go, to be <laughs> so, honest. So. so by this point, like, I mean, by three weeks in, I play like absolute fucking dog turd anyway, no matter where the tour is, probably from the aforementioned kicking too hard. But we landed in Perth, and then I got a DM from him. And was like, oh, I want to like, because we followed each other on Instagram. He said, like, oh, I want to come to the show, and I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, he comes, meet him, lovely guy. I play like absolute fucking shit. Maybe one of the worst times I've ever played. And then, like afterwards, I let's sit and have a drink with him, and he's got his mate with him. He's like, oh, this is my mate Steve. Blah blah blah. We're just talking, whatever. And um, and then. Steve was talking about not being being off tour or whatever, and I was like, oh, do, you, like "Do you play in a band?" And he was like, "Yeah, it's a band called Carnival." And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> I've just been I've just been terrible at drums in front of Steve Judd and fucking Brody Simpson." And I was just like, oh, "For fuck's sake!" Oh, that's bad, man. But he's another drum, like yeah, just guys that just think on a different level. He's in there. 
Absolutely. You know, I think it just like the lack of output from Carnival is probably the only reason he wasn't on my mind more like before. But as soon as you said Steve, when you were telling the story, I was like, oh, God, Steve Australian- is definitely one of those guys. Australian Steve. Um, other than Steve Ir- Irwin, the most famous Steve in Australia to <laughs> me. Um, but he was like, man, on like both of those sound awake particularly when i heard it it was just like amazing but just some of the like his symbol placements yeah are just crazy there's that middle section on i don't even know the fuck i don't even know song names anymore it's a middle section on one of the songs on the ascendancy and what's the fucking (laughs) trivia fucking album album? (laughs) that's a trivium (laughs) album what's the fucking you played on that um, do you mean asymmetry or do you mean asymmetry? Asymmetry, yeah. asymmetry is what I mean. The ascendancy. It's like fucking Steve Judd on Trivium. That'd be sick. <laughs> I just got Matt. I just got Matt Hafey on the brain now. I'm a twitcher. But no, there's a song. I can't remember the name of the song, but just it all cuts down, and he's just got this. It's just like a very. There's a subtle vocal, in, and then there's just this ride bell pattern that is just not not right in the <laughs> nicest possible way yeah yeah it's a stunning stuff he's so so like musical and cerebral and plays all dynamics so well as well yeah unbelievable yeah um so this is the last thing i wanted to officially ask you mm-hmm. is that some people might not know that you you run a popular youtube channel do i Drummer's Review. Oh, yeah. So so I'm not actually involved in that anymore. But, what? Yeah, so Drummer's Review was something I got approached to do by a man who is running it, who's an editor, previously has edited some of the UK magazines in the I music sphere. I thought it was sphere. you. No, no, no. So we got hired, my wife and I, who's a videographer, and we did it for about two years. Um, and then for a number of reasons, one being just simply that it stopped being as enjoyable um because you know there's only so many different things before you start kind of repeating yourselves or i felt like we started to get a lot of the same brand like a a review session would end up being lots of one brand or something like that like Um, the magazines yeah now the whole thing started out very much and i believe with every intention still continues this way to to be like an unbiased review platform which is what i really liked about it from the beginning because I didn't realise how bad it had gotten in magazines because I haven't bought or read magazines in a long time but apparently um, oh, it's, it's, crazy. it's literally like here's a review and then the next page is like a double page ad spread for that item and of course it's got like a five star review or whatever because they've paid to be in the magazine yeah oh, honestly towards the because the, I wrote for drama for a bit and like just towards the end of magazines lives which let's be honest magazines are dead yeah or and or dying like covers would only be people who the drum magazines have put and i think to an extent still are covers would only be people who that drum manufacturer has put the most money in that month right and the reviews you will never see a two-star review no. in a magazine no it's like I feel I, it's one of those things that I do feel sorry for people who have lost jobs or whatever, but printed magazines need to get in the sea. Like yeah. it's not impartial because you are run by the people you are funded by the people who are paying for the fucking advertisements. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really sucks for consumers, I think. So a hundred percent, but the internet exists luckily. Yeah. To an extent that's not happening. Yeah, and I think Drummer's Review has got a really cool idea. You know, we we decided when we set it out that we were going to, on day one that we started the project, we were going to define the microphones and the gain settings and the place that we recorded it at and then keep that absolutely the same for every review. And I was tuning all the drums and, you know, either either if a representative from the brand wanted to come and tune, that's totally fine, um, or... If not, I would tune it or whatever. And we put it through an equal playing field kind of test. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And we were very critical on some things, including some pretty high profile or expensive gear, like A&F stuff, for example, which... That's the Brody Simpson stuff, isn't it? It is, which, you know, I think in the context he's using it makes a lot of sense. But becoming the Emperor's new clothes, as it kind of did because of the aesthetic, 
you know, kind of turning them into such lustworthy items, especially in the UK where the markup with the imports and everything was insane. Unbelievable, yeah. Yeah, like three and a half grand for a snare drum where the hoops were bent and the whole thing kind of left weird metal dust on your fingers and couldn't be tuned and stuff. Mm. was a bit like, this isn't right. You could get Alan Van Cleef to do it for you. Yeah. With none of the aforementioned problems. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Um, So, yeah, we were very critical on, on some things. And it was really interesting. It was a hell of experience to, like, Especially to see what like mid range kits can be like, because they can be amazing, actually. Yeah. Um, and we did a few really cool back to back tests as well, like Tom heads. We did snare heads. I don't think we did as many when we did the snare heads, or we did um, snare rim, like batter rim comparisons. I watched that one. I watched all of them actually, and really? I did notice there was a different guy recently. Yeah. And I thought I was so sure it was you that had done it because. Because YouTube revenue, and obviously you just love drums. Yeah, I mean, I I did it because I love drums. I wish I saw some YouTube revenue of it. I don't think there was very much anyway. But um, uh, yeah, so now they have a whole new team. It's not my wife doing the video work. It's not the same studio. It used to all be done at Middle Farm Studios, which is kind of a studio which has become super well-known within the scene that we exist in. Um, so Isn't I, it? I think you're responsible for that. I don't think I'm fully responsible. Because fucking but it, Pete, it helps. Pete Miles, Pete Miles recorded my first band's EP. Yeah, back in the day. But uh, he he got out of metal a long fucking time ago. Yeah, I think you brought it back to you brought it to Middle Farm. Maybe. Yeah, I, I think I think it was just kind of right time, right place for for that kind of thing. And it's an amazing sounding drum room. We used it because it was not too far away, and it was a lot cheaper than other places, and it sounded great. And we liked Pete. But it was a lot more bare bones when we started going there, like five, six years ago. Um, and now it's really amazing. They've, there's this one guy that does lots of woodwork around there, and he's created all of this amazing furniture and spaces, and they totally redid the kitchen. And it's so comfortable and cozy now. And yeah, it's got. A, I've never been. No, you should go, man. You should go. Now I'm in Glasgow. It is oh, so yeah, far away. I would be fucking flying for definite. Well, um, we were actually going to see if you. Uh, I guess I can talk about this. We were recording some stray stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, and, but when COVID happened and Will Putney was like, Nolly's the only person in the UK that's doing it if that if it comes down really? to Really? That. Oh, but, that's really cool. Yeah. I didn't realise he, he thought of me in that way. That's awesome. But um, I think we're just going to wait out the pandemic and fucking do that. But I, sure. was, I was excited. And yeah. I'm sure it will happen at some point. Yeah, if it does, just, you know, I, I would love that as well. But... I know that Stray has their team and they do an amazing job. So, um, We are going to do some Patreon questions. This is a new new thing, a new thing that I'm doing. Is this the first give, thing or is this just to give back. generally new? Um, well, I actually just asked for a pound off everyone on the Patreon. I was like, listen up, motherfuckers. You ain't getting any perks. Just give me a pound because you like my podcast. And people gave me a pound, and I, and the more people that gave me a pound, I was like, oh, I guess, I guess you do deserve some sort of perk. It All literally right. says on the Patreon, "Don't give me more than a pound, you're not getting any perks." Well, well, fair play. That's honesty. You see, that's what is needed in the uh, the Instagram musician world. Yeah, give me a fucking quid. I'll continue doing what I'm doing, <laughs> but maybe slightly better. Anyway, but then I was like, you know what? Okay, you can get the episodes early because not first give me the video early, so that's fine. And then now you can you now you get in a question time. Perfect. Um, so just a lot of these I've already incorporated into what I was wanted. I wanted to talk to you about anyway because people are asking very simple questions. Well, maybe um, I can give simple potted answers because I feel like I've rambled a lot. No, you've been great. Here's here's the best the best one so far. And this is simply from Connor, and this is something I also want to know. Walk us through your express uh, espresso setup. Ah. The shots you post on your Insta are gorgeous. Mm. Where where do you get your beans? Oh, and then he's just popped in. Why do your records sound so fucking good? But <laughs> that's very... forget the last bit because we've already talked about that. Oh. But um, yeah, you got like a manual espresso thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, thanks for the compliments anyway. Um, the uh, I, I have a manual machine made by Rock, or is it ROK? I don't know. Um, I have no idea. My wife got it for me about four and a half, nearly five years ago as a present. Um, and 
I've just kind of stuck to that. Uh, I really, I love it. And when I first got it, it was an older design where it required more pressure and it was actually quite difficult to get really great espressos out of. And they kind of said not to put too much pressure. It's made out of really solid steel, but I guess some of the things like the screws holding the bolts, holding it together, maybe would be under too much stress. Um, so I struggled to get really great espressos out of it unless I was like, you know going you know really shaking trying to trying to push this thing with extreme force and not sure i should be doing it um but then they released an update which has like a they've redesigned a certain part of it and it's retrofittable to to my older one so that's made it a lot easier to get great espresso so that's been about a year and a half or two that i've had it like that um and i've got a sage it's fully manual you're responsible for pushing through yeah yeah, you, like, you fill it with hole. water in the top and you kind of lift the arms as you do it and it, it flows past the seal to fill the chamber above the portafilter and then you squeeze it down. So you have to boil the water in a kettle and pour it in. Um, do you think... I believe we might have talked about this really quickly before, but do you think there is... Because every musician I know who has like an attention to detail or, or who is like accomplished in their field... Almost exclusively, every single one of those loves coffee and loves bougie coffee and bougie coffee preparation. Do you think there is a a dopamine fueled skill reward situation happening that's similar to playing an instrument, like practicing, and then you you nail the lick and you're like fuck yeah, and your brain goes here's some dopamine. That, that's how I feel with coffee. Like when I get the espresso right, when I get my full extraction, I get my 40 grams in 30 seconds on the fucking dot. Then I froth my milk correctly. And then I pour a lovely, lovely Rosetta. I am. Um, it's the same as nailing a drum part. Yeah. I, I think you're definitely right with that. There's, there's a huge satisfaction in the process, isn't there? I think that's why I really like espresso as well, rather than filter. Um, I, I like filter, but it doesn't excite me to prepare it. Whereas like, there's days where honestly my excitement about making the espresso, like actually it, it, I'm like way more excited at the thought of it than I am even about the flavor of it. When I have it, I'm like, oh yeah, the espresso is really strong and, and kind of bitter. Like I almost forget in my excitement based on the visual, you know? Do you get excited about it before you go to bed? Do you get excited about making it in the morning? Because I Sometimes, get that. yeah. If, if I've got some fresh beans... Yeah, yeah, maybe. Sometimes I say night to my machine. Or I'm like <laughs> going and I'll just be like, see you in the morning, babe. Because <laughs> I can't fucking wait. And do you know what? I'm out of fucking beans. No way. Well, you, I had to, to answer the, the 14 question. gram, 14 what? gram espresso. That's just yeah. not right, mate. There's no satisfaction in that. It was horrible. How much did you extract? Did you, did you do like a 24 gram? No, like a no, 34 no, gram? No, so... so it two, one the, because I need the caffeine, I... Tamp too hard on purpose yeah. because I only had 14 grams of beans and I did 50 grams in 30 seconds from 14 grams of coffee. What does that taste like? And it, horrible, but I needed the caffeine. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so I was like just fully over extracted because I didn't have enough coffee to get enough caffeine. Yeah. My morning one was nice though. Fair enough. Where, where are you going to get your next beans from? So I walked, so we were talking about Origin. There's yeah. my local, there's two local places here. Um, one of them is run by the guy that was in that band Flood of Red um, Market. And they sell, I think it's called Tin Soldier Beans. They're pretty good. But then there's one down the road, which I walked to today, which sells Origin. Mm. And I was going there. And both of them closed on Wednesdays. Oh, wow. So I'm fucked. So it'll probably be, probably Origin... I always go, I'll pick up a bag of Origin or this, I think it's called Tin Soldier. It's like a Glasgow roaster, but it's really good. Um, while I wait for my my standard union revelation, because I've just got, I've, I've got, I've got it dialed in right. so well that I can't, there's nothing more annoying than getting some beans and it, not being nice. Yeah, I agree. We spoke the other day because I got, you know, we were talking about has been, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I got two Costa Ricans. One of them's pretty nice, but I've got a feeling that both of them would be better as filter than 
espresso. So I'm slightly regretting that. And I'm just finishing a bag of Origin, which I've really enjoyed, a Kenyan one, which you can't get anymore. They've, they've run out of it. It was annoying. I got that and I got an El Salvadorian from Origin. And both of those have given me the, the most Insta-worthy um, crema. Like, really dark. I even had someone like, that looks over-extracted, but it's it's not. Like, the texture is really fluid and fine and, and rich. Um, so I'm really annoyed. But I've, I've got a couple more bags from them, which are totally different arriving, which I'm looking forward to. I think Union for Espresso has potentially been my favourite. Yeah, I'm the same. I've had some really good beans from a local roaster called Triple Co. that are based in Bristol. Um, I've also had some really good beans from another local one. Like these two roasteries are probably equidistant on either side of me. It's called uh, Round Hill Roastery, but I've kind of stopped doing theirs as much. Um, don't know why. I think maybe there was a time where they didn't have much turnover, or they were getting like a lot. I think there was a point where they were just only getting Colombian beans in, and I'm sure they all tasted very different and whatever. But at some part of me wanted more variation in in the name of my coffee, which. Which is probably stupid, but um, no, is that... I know what you mean. Yeah, it's like I feel like it's the closest thing to like being into toys when you're a kid, <laughs> like when you're an adult. Like this yeah. one's the same as the other one. This is just Donatello with a different outfit on. <laughs> I want Michelangelo. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, come on. I should probably ask some musical ones. What is a Peter uh, Sam Jones? <coughs> What is a piece of advice you'd give to people recording from home which can transform mixes slash projects? Do you think this guy's asking about drums specifically? Because uh, No, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, if it's not about drums and it's about guitars or vocals or bass, um, just getting the performances absolutely nailed. And I don't just mean like on time and sorry on on the grid and and uh, in tune i mean like the character of everything being awesome i'm currently mixing a project which has lots of contributors um it's not a traditional band so there's there's like different di files for guitar players being sent from different people and stuff and the it's pretty amazing there's one drummer all the drums are done in one session sorry there's two drummers actually but they recorded in the same session and um, some songs come together so easily because, like, the guitars on the bass are done with such great character. They're recorded so well in time. Everything's in key, but they're, like, they've got swagger, if, if that makes sense. Like, they're really performed um, like you hear on an amazing record. And there's a couple where it's obviously been done a bit more amateur. And, like, you look on the grid, it's in time. There's nothing you can complain about there. It's, you know, it's pretty damn in tune. But it just sounds kind of a bit limp, or what is it not, like the attack of yeah, the note? Yeah, like the or? attack. And I mean, guitar is very expressive. Distorted guitar, like catching just a tiny bit of finger or changing your pick angle, you kind of get different ways that notes can bloom. And, and experienced players kind of do that um, very intuitively in a way that sounds amazing. But there's yeah, there's like a certain level of playing which is functional but doesn't doesn't do that thing when you then construct the mix together it all just sounds a bit flat and lacking energy so i I guess maybe energy or commitment or um there's a word which i'm reaching for that i can't remember but yeah essentially like committing to the part with the performance not Um, being complacent with what what you put down yeah yeah not like oh that will do yeah but even beyond that like not being afraid to give it some swagger you know, nice. actually aiming and for it, that. His other... Like, let's assume he was talking about drums, recording drums okay. at home. Now, we can answer that really quickly. I'm fairly sure we're on the same wavelength here. Um, unless you have good shit, just program them until uh, you can get into a studio. Maybe, yeah. I think unless, yeah, unless you've got... Part, it doesn't need to be the most expensive mics. I don't think mic preamps make much difference at all unless you're distorting them, which you don't really need to do. Um, oh, that's an interesting bit of info because I'm actually in the market for a new interface because yeah. Mac have just fucking destroyed. I did one Mac update and now my interface is dead. Right. So, and I'm like, do I get a focus right Scarlet for fucking three hundred pounds, or do I get a Universal Audio 
for three thousand pounds. Yeah. There's honestly not going to be a huge amount of difference if you are running them clean. It's it's I think the microphone preamps are probably the one of the biggest like snake oil things in in the recording industry. The C- the CBD of the uh recording industry. Is that right? Yeah, it's like um it's I think there's a lot in music in general in in instruments and equipment which comes from days when things were way less good <laughs> to where yeah, yeah, people yeah. would have very strong preferences or production lines com- brands had very limited range with quite minor differences between the things so those difference points were quite meaningful at that time but now i'm thinking of things like guitars like people obsess over the body wood of an electric guitar i'm not saying it yeah. does nothing but in no way does it define the sound of an electric guitar over so many of the other often electrical components or hardware on 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 the uh, the yeah. guitar uh these days there's so much variation and also the standard in general has gotten so much better that a lot of the comparisons that people draw are between incredibly minor things that don't have much appreciable effect especially within the kind of music that we do because there's no way that using a neve preamp instead of an api preamp on your snare bottom is going to mean that the mixer is going to do anything different to that signal and there's no way you're going to really hear the difference um yeah in context to be honest like I've been down I mean, that rabbit you, hole. You were maybe one one of the one of the first people that showed me just what you can do with like just fucking in the box plugins. Because I remember you came around to m- mine, and we did a little thing, and then you had a little to just fuck around on whatever I was using at the time, Cubase or whatever, and just made it sound incredible. And a lot of people actually, when they asked me about recording drums, still to this day on the podcast, on Twitch or whatever, I always just say go and get Nolly's creative live thing because he really isn't holding back like some people like the tom the the tom the fab filter tom trick is game changing shit and a lot of people would keep that shit to themselves maybe that's cool you think so i mean yeah i don't know if it's just naivety on my part or what but i'm very happy to share those things And, and i guess doing it quite a few times now um there's two things which is one i get to actually then interact with some people that have found those those tips to be useful and have used them to really great ends and i get to hear cool sounding music that wouldn't have happened in the past i mean that's like that's very self-serving kind of thinking about it and then on the other side it's like well if it, well, maybe two more points. One, it kind of forces me to come up with something different, even if it's not like moving away from that. It's like finding something yeah. else that's new. And then secondly, you realize how much of like your sonic signature, if you're a mixer or an engineer, comes from just your ears and all of the tiny adjustments that you make, which are not really method like to do with any kind of weird method. It's just you reacting and doing your thing. And even though you can give away lots and lots of tricks, nobody else is gonna do something that sounds exactly like you maybe they can do something which sounds exactly like a given recording in the past but they can't do something which is going to sound like the next thing that you do yeah. that they haven't heard yeah. and analyzed yet they can't steal the brain yeah okay we're going to do some rapid fire ones yeah sorry this is long there's uh no no it's not your fault there's a uh, 36 so i'm not going to do all 36 all right. but a lot of them i've already asked but one here's a good one i like this one um what's the album with your favorite mix the go-to that you uh, i guess this is two separate ones this is from phil blaney okay what's the album he says with the best production ever made but i'm guessing he means like mix yeah um the go-to that you put on to test a studio setup so are they going to be the same uh i wonder um what I do don't you know. Test, what do you ring out some speakers with? You know, honestly, uh, you could look at this as arrogant, but I, I like to hear something I've worked on because I know what that sounds like and I know how my ears react that to it. That makes sense. If that makes sense. It's yeah. not so much about like, oh, yeah, I want to hear my work really loud as much as I just know what what I'm doing, you know, what, what I'm hearing. Um, But the, geez, I don't know, the, the best 
ever done. Um, God, I don't know. Or your favourite, to... not not like, it doesn't have to yeah. be. Something which I just love to hear. Do you know what I test? I actually use one of yours to test things when I want to see if like a new, when I just got, I just got hooked up with a bunch of uh, Sonos stuff. I mean, I didn't get hooked up, I paid for it, but as in I hooked my house up with yeah. a bunch of the Sonos stuff and uh, I put fucking Doomsday on. Oh, just that yeah. snare, the snare at the start of Doomsday. <sighs> That's a fucking snare. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, no, that's I, I, a snare. I was really pleased. You're with, lucky. With this how a, that you're lucky. Out. It's a flam, isn't it? Is it a flam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're he's, lucky. He's it's Captain a flam, flam, though. He's Captain it would be flam. Dan Sell, Captain Flam. Uh, yeah, he's you're got lucky a great set, though because set of flams. it would have been stolen. It would have been like the Paramore snare because everyone's had that. That's true. I never even thought about that. Yeah, that's true. Do you mean, by the way, the single version of Doomsday or the album version? Because they're slightly different. I believe I mean the single version. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because we did we retracked the drums for the for Holy Hell as a record because we recorded the single about six months before that. Um, but we kept all all the rest of it from the original Doomsday, but redid the drums. So the one on the record sounds a little bit different. But um, yeah, no. Dan Seal loves a good flam. Um, there's, there's some points where it's just like flam after flam after flam. I remember because they, they're a band that specifically want samples on their drum sound. Like they don't want it to sound natural. So I had to go through and make all the trigger points so it did it accurately. And for some reason, the, the process I was using never picked up on flams. I'd have to manually add the second snare. So I remember just at times like being incredulous at how many flams I actually had to like put to like <laughs> set up the trigger points for in a given song because it would be like part of the part. Anyway, yeah. I I don't know is honestly the answer to like the best ever. Um I wish I had an answer to that, man. There's so many sounds that I appreciate over the history of recording from Beatles through Electric Light Orchestra through Steely Dan through um maybe oh, not so much stuff in the one. 80s. Um, just give me one. Just all right. From, from the world of metal, I think Gajira's "Art of Dying" stands on a pedestal. Fuck, absolutely, fuck yeah, agreed. Especially for the time. Agreed. Who is it that f- had him mix something recently, and it does sound a lot like it? Was it Bleed from Within, or did they get you to mix it? Uh, he did mix something for Bleed from Within, but that's a few albums ago, so I don't know if that's what you mean. I think I remember hearing that. I mean, recently for me is like five years ago. Okay, no, this, right, this, this is going this, back beyond, but yeah. Quick fire. Um, favorite album that you've produced? Uh, Jesus. From Billy Grove. Billy Grove. What are you doing to me, mate? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I really like. Let's just look at something recent. I really like. Uh, Car Bombs record and and I really nice. like Haken's record their recent I think those two probably also in part because they were incredibly easygoing and the band wait did you mix mess me, what, what's it called not meta what? no Mordial I mixed which one's that one the recent one, one before that one the recent one yeah I don't think I've heard that which is you the one with the fucking it. I mean I I literally only got into them two years ago after ignoring them for 10 years. Right. I don't know why. And everyone's like, shit, it's bad now. I was like, nah. And then whatever that fucking song is, you know the one with the fucking meow noise. <laughs> There's lots of them with that noise. But yeah. The one that's from Meta with the meow uh, noise. So yeah. That was like, wow, this band fucking rips. Check out the new album. It's, it's amazing. And you know that they track without a click, right? Yeah, I've seen, I saw they, they recorded it in... Silver Chord, didn't they? Yeah. The Gojira place. I saw a video and they're just old school guide track, drums. Mm. That's fucking sick. Elliot's fucking phenomenal drummer. He's unbelievable, man. He's one we should have mentioned earlier. He's like a different octopus brain. Yeah. All right, okay. The top the top rated question, because I've got people to just like other ones if they wanted, is literally about... The Doomsday snare. Really? Okay. How, how much? How much time did he spend on getting the first snare hit of Doomsday to sound absolutely perfect? But you've just told me it's a sample, so. Well, it's some sample. the 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 single version is actually more sample, and it's specifically using 
quite old school samples that were used by like Andy Sneap and Colin Richardson in the early 2000s because of Josh Middleton being in the band and telling me that he wants it to sound a bit like that. Um, and then what, the, Slate Snare no, Z1 no, or something slate. like that. It's the, Elis- the Elisis D4 like drum machine, Fuck. which those guys use. I actually have one, but I also have just like the, the wave files. Um, as oh, you do. just ruined a bunch of people's lives there, including my own, because I fucking I put that on. I mean, the whole mix is good though. But but it's blended. It's there's a real snare in there, and it's got a lot of the middle farm room sound as well. It's just on the single version. If you hear that like pss, like that top end like white noise, that's what the sample's yeah. doing in there. Um, I mean, this one's this one's going to be long, but okay. It's, it's a highly it's highly rated this is going to be the last one um because i'm late for streaming i don't care because this is fine um well just your entire experience this is from ben moran who isn't asking for much okay uh <laughs> just your just your entire experience of working with animals as leaders predi- particularly from a production point of view when the sounds are complex new and multi-layered thanks y- yeah Very polite. Um- Sure. I can. I mean, I guess I can step in on without going into too much detail. It was a really interesting process. I think it was probably what I'd consider to be the first of the professional, like first record I did as a professional engineer, but I was in no way really prepared for it. Um, it was quite overwhelming because I flew from Australia direct to LA and we went from the airport to the studio, I want to say. Um, and annoyingly, Garska had been in the day before. That wasn't the annoying bit, but the engineer had already set everything up and kind of it was just the way it was, apparently. Um, oh. And he'd totally messed up the snare top microphone. He he was running it through a tape machine and you just he put it through an 1176, which doesn't do much apart from make the bleed a lot worse and the snare sound more ringy. God, and then Nolly hates preamps. I love it. <laughs> Well, that's a compressor. Um, but then he, he slammed that onto the tape machine to the point where the snare top okay, really Nolly sounded hates, like Nolly a Nolly hates analog. <laughs> yes. Nolly <laughs> hates analog. That's what I meant there. Yeah, it was rubbish, man. I think that one, the fact he did that caused me years of anguish because I never liked how the drums came out and it was partly because well, so you just the kept snare. it? I didn't even realise that that's what it was really like because I was a bit overwhelmed. I was jet lagged. It was a nice posh studio with a console and he was talking so romantically about all the talking. amazing gear the man was talking <laughs> yeah you know he was talking um and i you know it was on a console and he had the room mics really loud so we were monitoring everything sounded like led zeppelin and i was like oh i guess this is cool this is what they do in la and it wasn't until i got to mixing i was like why does the snare top sound like a mono overhead room mic kind of thing so Which what did you do there's a lot of sample, sample it there's a there, lot of there sample. Is sample yeah oh. I think it. I mean, I love the way that record sounds. Do you? I, the sim the symbols sound like weird. They're made out of tobacco. Yeah, <laughs> good. Yeah, that sounds about right. But I love it. Oh, cool. It just this. It sounds like it's made out of tobacco, recorded in a fully wooden room. Yeah. Um I like it. Or <laughs> maybe in like an inner sauna, recorded in a sauna with the temperature <laughs> kiln dried symbols. Yeah, I mean, I just. I wish I could go back in time and do it again, I think is the point. I don't think it would be as good. I think you captured a time. Really? You captured a moment, yeah. Well, what if 100%. I went back in time and did it again with my knowledge now? Then it would it would still be a moment, you know? Yeah, but it would be <laughs> a fucking the doomsday snare on that. <laughs> yeah, that's what it should be. I'd just use the doomsday flam sample on every hit. But that's my favourite. that's my favourite sounding animals album. Yeah, I mean, they're a band that's always tried to do things themselves wherever possible. And I think, uh, if I can say this, I think it's sometimes to a fault. I mean, for example, in terms of band management, like they've typically not had management most of their career. And I think that's fine because there's three of them. But I think that if they were a bigger band that had to split money more ways, um, they would have lost out on serious income by not having professional management that's i don't know if that's going to inside the no inner workings, i think there's like but... there's a bunch of like the diy proggy yeah proggy scene where there is an i'm not saying animals do this but there is an element with a lot of bands where they're like well 
well, I'm this good at my instrument, so I obviously know more than the manager about doing this thing. I'm not saying Animals is like that, but I know no. some prog bands like that. Really? And they end up sh fucking shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. The reason you're that good at your instrument is because you haven't spent the amounts of time figuring out the business side of things and that's probably why i'm not actually that good at drums right but i'm doing okay nolly <laughs> you're doing great mate. you're doing great <laughs> it, it's going there's like there's a trade-off at some point um right okay come on rapid fire i'm yeah. gonna get in so much trouble for being fucking late to the stream oh this one's nice this is wholesome what's your perfect sunday perfect sunday uh lying a little bit have a decent brunch Hopefully the weather's good. What's on, what's on brunch menu? Um, maybe some like eggs with actually Ali from Benedict from bake uh, eggs Benedict. Yeah, could be. I'm not very good at poaching eggs, but I do love them. Um, but Ali from from Architects showed me this thing with Heinz baked beans, but with lots of sage and garlic in there, and it's so tasty. He, he cooked that up for me that. for breakfast. You just chuck a load of, of like crushed up sage and, and garlic in there and let it stew for a long time. It doesn't taste like Heinz baked beans anymore. That with some nice so sourdough and either like some, I don't know, sausage, anything brunchy. Sounds glorious. Yeah, I'm, Sounds I'm hungry absolutely now. glorious. Uh, um, so am I, so I'm not going to, I'm going to fucking rapid this shit up. Um, yeah. Wait, what were you going to say? I was going to say, walk a dog, watch some TV, not have to do any annoying chores, and feel energised for Monday. That's Sunday. Fair, that was a wholesome answer. Yeah. Um, if you had... Oh, this, I mean, this one... Why am I picking the long ones? I'm supposed to have asked you the top five bands as well, but I don't... Can you give me the top five bands quickly? No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fuck. Top three. Give me your top three. Um, I don't know. Maybe sixth has to be up there. Um, I feel like there's so much that I'm not reaching in my brain whenever these questions get asked that I just I just can't think of. Um, let me just look at a list of bands that I listen to a lot. Ask me the next question and then come back to this one. Okay. 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 Dream kit and snare combo to track with from Dan Patterson. Um, I mean, I think a Tama Star Classic Maple. I'm not saying it's a dream, but I mean, it sounds amazing. You know it. Yeah. It's, I mean, they're, they're great kits. You know. it's, not, it's not like, you know, if a genie appeared, that would be what I'd wish for, but it would be amazing. Well, that's what he's fucking asking, Nolly. He's <sighs> asking dream kit. But then there kit, would be some genie, weird genie thing. I, I really that's like, fine. I really like Evette's drums. Evette's drums. Yeah, Australian. Yeah, I've reviewed they make a couple normal, of those. normal drums, though? Yeah, they do I kits. I just snares. No, I reviewed a kit with Drummer's Review, and it was unbelievable. Okay, that's the fucking answer, then. Yeah, also, yeah, Also, you're giving a small small company a little bit of coverage. That's true. Uh, okay, what snare, though? Um... I almost shed a tear, and I'm not joking, but I was really, really sleepy at the time when I heard somebody playing my new Q Drumco Gentleman's Brass Snare, which is like an eight lug, slightly deeper Black Beauty, slightly thicker. And I know it the just tunes so well. And it had like just a little bit of moon gel on it, but it felt so lovely and dry with just the right amount of overtone. And yeah, I was really cracked out. It was a really tough session, and it was near the end. And we had a lot of problems, mm. and we whipped that snare out. And I, I, literally, I literally did shed a tear. But well, not, not not going from, like, just happy state to crying, but, like, just a lot of relief and enjoyment involved. I once cried, um, just a, shed a tear from the Papa John Cinepie pizza. You ever had one of those? <laughs> no. It's basically, it's a dessert, but they make like a cinnamon roll, but on a pizza base. Okay. Um, and, you know, first bite, little tear. Really? It was just, um, just unbelievable. I mean, Molly. I'm salivating thinking about oh, it. It was, uh, it was insane. Give me fucking two more bands you like, and then we're going to go. This has been lovely, though. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm literally just scrolling. Oh, Ocean Size. That's a band I'd like to mention. Absolute. All right. Well, one of my all-time favorites. Top bands ever. Yeah. Nice. Absolutely, yeah. Um, are they st they're not still going, are they? No. What do any of them do? They do anything? The lead singer has done some solo records that are amazing. They're called. He's called Venart. That's his surname. 
And he's also just set up a Patreon, which I'm I started donating to, where he's talking a lot about um, the old Ocean Size recordings and doing playthroughs of them and talking about the way the parts are structured, which is really interesting. They have three guitarists and yeah, cool. fascinating. How much is it a month though, Nolly? How much is it a month? I forget. It's, I think it's like a fiver Sh- or something. It should be. A, it should be a pound. Anyway, <laughs> go on, one more, one more fucking band. You've paused my video, but I don't care. Uh, we're, we're both hungry. I want to yeah. cry at the cinnabar, and I have to go straight to a stream. Okay, all right, work, all right, work, all right. Work. I'm just, I'm just looking. Uh, Tigran Hamasian. Oh fuck yeah! We could have done a whole podcast talking about him. Yeah, I wish he did more with um, Arthur though. Is Arthur not did drumming he do another album? Anymore? Well, uh, he did one album, Mock Root, didn't he? Yeah. And then didn't do anything for two albums. Has he done another one since then with Arthur? I don't actually know. I think I just assumed that Arthur was on the, no. the new one, The Call Within. Is he not? Oh, maybe maybe he's back for that. I do remember seeing something, but I haven't heard it. But I I, I had brunch, actually, with Arthur once. Did you? Um, and uh, he had a lot of interesting things to say which i won't say in public because they're for him to say um but fucking amazing drummer amazing amazing musicians yeah going on there yeah oh, i'm gonna listen to i think you showed me mock Root, actually i've oh, never heard it before yeah. i got shown by tosin when we did animals as leaders he put me in his his car and played it and it blew my mind and he's on the well, new you record put me in your car because I believe we went to Nando's or somewhere mm. in town. Um, and you put it on and it blew my mind. Wow. And I'm pretty sure I put it on and blew someone else's mind. So that's the the car, the, the uh, what's, what's, what's it called? The, when you pass something down. Uh, like like a lineage. Well, an lineage. heirloom, yeah. Well, it's also viral of... growth, isn't it, mate? Imagine if people are listening to this podcast in their cars, maybe they're going to then put it on in their car and have their minds blown and then show someone else the podcast. Tigran Hamasian Mock Root. Yeah. Put it on, blow your mind and show you whoever's next to you. Yeah. Right. We're fucking done here. This has been wonderful. Though. It has. I wish we could keep going, but I also I mean, wish we, we could, could stop. <laughs> <laughs> we can do another one. We'll do a yeah, follow-up. Sure. Yeah. Um, send me your file. Will do. Um, it's been a pleasure, mate. It and, has, uh, yeah. Great to catch up. And it's kind of funny that can... it's all caught on, on podcast. Now, yeah, exactly. That's literally it's just a fact. This, these are my favourite episodes. Great. I did one with actually Ali Architects the other day and we just caught up and it was like, that's the best. Oh, what a great person um, he is. And now we can actually, he's the best. Now we can actually speak to each other on whatsapp without you feeling like we have to do the podcast that's right yeah well i'm very pleased that we made it happen nice one mate take care yeah you too mate you too bye 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 bye